So yeah, 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 we know we're all connected. Oh my God. <laughs> so much connectivity. It's just, it's, I don't know. I'm terrible at Facebook and at LinkedIn and at plankton or plaques, whatever those things are called. I just, I, I just can't say no. I don't want to be your friend and I have too many friends. I'm just too connected. I'm just too connected. But that's really not anything new. We've always actually had all this connectivity. The new thing is just having access to this much connectivity at an instant. So that's, that's new. I mean, the Buddhists would say we were connected forever, right? I mean, make me one with all the Zen hot dog salesman speech. <laughs> but if you're a lot like me, and some of you are designers and uh, and content providers, as they say in the corporate world, dare I say artists, um, wow. <clears throat> we spend a lot of time looking at nothing. <laughs> looking at things that actually are not there at all. And so I introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, the night sky as a metaphor. Because when you look at the night sky, the first thing you see is all of these points of light, these stars, these these beautiful things, but it's really hard to look at the space between them. But I'm really interested in that space. So, I've been thinking a lot about constellations. Here's a constellation. What's a constellation? A constellation is this totally imaginary picture that's been, that's been placed by your own mind, like kind of in your own mindscape, almost like a daydream in the nighttime, into the celestial sphere. And it's up there in such a way that you can navigate around the world in the middle of the night all across the ocean. That's a pretty powerful uh, effect of a, something that comes completely from the imagination. And if you get a whole lot of these in the sky, look, then the night sky lo actually looks like this, instead of like that first picture I thought I showed you. Now that is not the way the sky looks to me when I look up at night, but I'm not one of those ancient sailors who figured all of this out and saw all of those things. What an extraordinary act of the imagination. Take a look at this picture. That's kind of when all those things, those mythical beasts and creatures and surrealist, I don't know, some of them are just plain strange objects, when they got painted, and this was around the 1700s, somebody took them out of the sky, put them on a desk and painted them all and they looked like that. That's, an, that's, a, that's a work of art. So it's art in the cosmos, these mapping of these two things merging to tell us where we are in the universe. And it's these patterns. That's what I'm interested in. How, what are the patterns through all this connectivity that can help us navigate our, our own lives through, through the complexity of all of this connectedness? Here, I'm just gonna show you a few of these <laughs> constellation images that they, that they came up with. I mean, and when I look at the night sky, I do not see some sort of a camel donkey with a moose running down its back and a <laughs> young shepherd with a sigh. I mean, wow, that's, but that is amazing. And that's what they saw when they just saw these little points of light. Or look at this one, this one's really, this one's kind of scary. It's kind of a dogfish <laughs> who plays a golden harp. And I think some alchemical tools down here and maybe his grandmother's uh, furniture or something. I don't know. But, <laughs> It's pretty amazing. These are mnemonic. This is gets scary and rather hallucinogenic. Don't look at the sky, I think. Is. <laughs> but those are, the, those are these mnemonic devices to help us see where we are in the universe and traverse this complex course. Okay, so <clears throat> anybody know what this little constellation is? <laughs> what a crowd. It's, you're too good. It's Cassiopeia. Sure it is. That's... Five stars, three of them are named here. Now, it's interesting to think about the space between, the, all the potential that lies in the space between <laughs> those points. And I, I can say it for random, like let's just change the name of those stars and we can call them painting, architecture, and foam rubber. <laughs> now let's make a constellation for me personally, because that's what I'm looking for. How do I connect the dots in my life? Foam rubber plays actually some important role in my life, as it turns out. But, we won't talk about this this time. Um, so anyway, we'll just go back to Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia turns out to be a woman who sits on a chair and looks at herself in the mirror in the middle of the night sky. And that's pretty amazing when you can see that to me, I think. Once again, what an act of the imagination. So around when I was 24 or so, I was having a rather difficult time trying to 
figure out what I was supposed to do in my life. I was interested in architecture. I was interested in cooking. I'd gone to cooking school. I was interested in singing and dancing and doing ah, theater and I don't know. I just thought those things were all connected. And, 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 I, and this was my constellation, I think. I drew this picture around then, and I didn't know whether I was coming or going. Or My constellation kind of was taking me in a, in a dotted line path in a rather continuous loop. <laughs> so I'll show you a photograph. This is a photograph of the studio that I had with my younger brother, Chris, over here in Alston, Massachusetts. And we were making all this stuff in the studio. So a friend of mine said, you know, Doug, you really, need to, you really need to choose whether you want to focus on one thing or the other thing. And I, it's like, it seemed like, those seem like, that seems true. That seems like really good advice. But I, I, don't, see how, I don't see how I can focus on those things. Uh, because they all seem like one thing. And, uh, I mean, if I were alive several hundred, maybe a thousand years ago, I would have to do all those things anyway. I would have to be like growing my food and, and making my clothes and telling stories to people anyway, so it would all be connected. But I thought recently, I just looked at this picture and I thought it looks a little bit like that painting with all the constellations and, I, and all the crazy you know, mythical beasts and creatures, except I had made all of these things. So that was kind of a aha moment. <clears throat> maybe there's a pattern. <laughs> Maybe there's a constellation in my life that I can look at. So I drew the studio. <clears throat> and when I drew the studio, I saw something interesting. I, I, I realized that I had power over the composition of my world. <laughs> and that this particular drawing, there's no figure, there's no ground, it's all the same thing. There's no space between the space. It's all, it, it's all filled. It's all filled with significance to me. And so I thought maybe there is some sort of interesting key here. And I remembered when I was in college, I had taken a trip to Pompeii, <clears throat> where an amazing moment happened when space and matter traded places once, 79 AD, I think it was. And Mount Vesuvius erupted, and there was lots of debris and ash, and fell upon the people, and it, 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 it killed them, uh, as we know. <laughs> But uh, what's interesting is that it had preserved this perfect frozen moment so perfectly that later in the 1700s, ex ex excavators, could f they found these little air pockets that had been preserved perfectly. By the, the, the bodies had decayed, leaving air, space, and this, what had been space had become solid. <clears throat> they poured plaster in these air pockets and they found these incredible plaster mummy, mummies that captured that moment so extraordinarily so many thousands of years ago. Here they are ex excavating those. You can imagine what that moment must have been like. So I had been drawing some pictures of space then. I started thinking, what is it like if I try to draw space around a sitter? I was interested in furniture and I was interested in design and I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna, what happens if we can think of furniture as the solidification of space around a human activity? What does that look like? It doesn't look like the square boxes anymore. We don't move in 90 degree angles. We cut the things in parallel lines. That's easier to construct, but it isn't how we live. We live, I don't live that way. <clears throat> anyway, so I started making some chairs that were based on the principles of Mount Vesuvius, really, Pompeii. So I, created a sandbox and I sat in it and I got a nice comfortable position and I said, hey, I, I kind of like that impression I made. <laughs> and, uh, and so I poured plaster of Paris into that and I poured polyurethane foam around that and I told you foam is important in my life. Um, <laughs> and I sat in it and I still have this chair, it's like 30 years later and I use it every day. So it was really an act of the solidification of space around my ass, I suppose you could say, but... <laughs> So I made some variants of this. This is the suspense chair. It keeps you in suspense. <clears throat> On the, each of these, there's a spring, and the spring is balanced to, to the weight of that particular limb. So you're kind of floating in space. And it, it's, it's, I don't know. It's kind of nice. Anyway. <laughs> Around this time that I was making these things, I noticed, uh, I happened upon this photograph of something called the Mertzbau. Does anybody know this? Oh, some people know the Mertz Baths, great. Well, but Kurt Schwitters, the great collage artist, Dadaist, um, sort of Dadaist, he was a Mertzist, really. He created these environments, which 
when I saw this little tiny black and white photograph, it just completely dawned on me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, that's kind of like a constructed constellation. That seems like it, he made up the space that made, it has so much significance. I want to be there. I want to live in that space. I want to transform. I want to make it look just, I want to make something like that, except I want to make it so that everything is really useful. Well, it was useful for him. It was a pure, perfectly spiritual experience. He was making a chapel to eroticism. As it turns out, that's not what my chapel to eroticism would look like, but <laughs> my... So I got the opportunity to design a, a, an office for my father at Johnson Wax, who was uh, an executive there. Johnson Wax, as you probably know, the, the headquarters were famously designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, who, since I was a, a great fan of Frank Lloyd Wright, and so was my father, he said, well, he quoted Lao Tzu as having said, architecture is not the walls and floors, it's the space within that is to be lived in. Okay, well, now I've quoted that him, and you can quote me as quoting Lao Tzu and Frank Lloyd Wright, so it's much easier. But still, isn't it interesting to think about that solidification of space, the space between the stars? What is a constellation, and how do we make these patterns in our lives that help us guide ourselves through important moments of our lives? So I designed and built uh, uh, this, this office for my father, and, and, and uh, I will just say that it led to other things. In order to do it, because I'd done a lot of theater and theater design, I decided to construct the whole office in cardboard in full scale, because I thought it was just as easy as making a small model. Might as well make a big model. Then you can walk inside and say, is the desk the right thing? Is the angle the right way? So I said, move it around this way. That's much better. So, so I figured, OK. Then I got a, a, a commission to design a kitchen with my good friend Ross Miller. And this is how it looked, and it looks so much like the Mertzbau, except all of these things have a, a very specific practical function. Up there is the microwave oven, and over here is the coffee maker uh, inside there, and then this is the actual oven, and this over here is the refrigerator, and every one of those things is actually a cabinet. And it, it functions in such a way that you don't actually have to walk in parallel lines to cook, but it, rather than you reach over here, you put this thing there. And it was kind of like we did this dance with the client and figured it all out. She decides that she can open the refrigerator door with her foot so we didn't actually have to put a handle on it and impure it, make it impure. <laughs> this is the ceiling in that kitchen, like 15 different ceiling, ceiling panels coming together like tectonic plates and letting the light fall in, the sky fall into the room. So. Jump cut. <clears throat> Here we go. Around this time, my brother, who was living in Detroit, and being a, a post-grad, uh, had no money, but he did have a lot of books, and he had no bookshelf, and he had no reading chair. And I visited him. And I said, hmm, no bookshelf, no, book, no, uh, no bookshelf, no chair. Bookshelves. It's a pun, but it brought these things together. So that's a perfect. So I drew these measurements off of his body to make sure that it was comfortable for him specifically. And now I look at this thing, uh, uh, and look, it, if you start to imagine, it looks like a constellation, <laughs> little points of light that are connected by these measurements, which are not abstract. And in fact, if you stare at it long enough, I can think you can see Cassiopeia reclining on the <laughs> But she wasn't there. But we did build, we did build this thing. <laughs> and he still has it in his house for after 30 years, and it seems uses it every day. Well, that bookshelf led me to make a bunch of different variations on the theme of mixing things together, colliding these different points of reference. Uh, yeah, shifting, moving between the categories. What, um, and so this is a library and a chair in one, <laughs> obviously. So. Um, this got built, and I got a commission from a, a friend of mine to, to design an interior, a little private library in France. Um, and the rule was, all bookshelves must be chairs, all chairs must be bookshelves. <laughs> and I, there, it was an old, old farmhouse, so we had to reach up into the window there with one of the chairs, so it got to, it got to be this rather elongated, stretched out chair shelf Japanese thing, I don't know. <laughs> So here, here is, that, here is that, that first one, really. And it's funny when you start doing this and you start building puns, <laughs> your mind goes into different connection-making capabilities. And so rather than, an, rather than a drawer, 
that what looked like it was going to be the right thing there. It, you, you pull out an ottoman, but it looks like a drawer. It's got these little brass knobs on it, and you just put your feet. And rather than like a pedestal, you get now a place to just support your muse or your cup of coffee or whatever it is you need. So this is a little view. All these little, these little places became kind of mindscape zones of their own, little places for your own imagination to, to grow. Um, and I thought of them as islands in the Adriatic and made the carpet blue. <laughs> So you could all be in the same room together, but having an isolated zone to concentrate in. This is a ladder back chair, obviously. <laughs> so later, with all those little variations, I got a, a commission from a German company, the Fraunhofer Institute. They wanted some sculptures that would help the, the scientists communicate with each other, encourage communication between the scientists who were doing pure research and the scientists who were doing practical applied science projects. They had a huge atrium in between these two uh, factions and they, they invited me to just come up with some, I don't know, some things. So I, 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 I decided chairs would be a great place because causing them to stay in one place for a little while. So I drew a couple of different, a number of different ideas. They, of course, selected this one, which looks a lot like the other one. But then, then they also selected this one which then I had to build, which was very complicated. <laughs> but we did end up building it. That one actually looked like that, and all the scientists were, were encouraged to bring little uh, books and periodicals and things that meant something important to them and put it there in the, in, the, in the scheme of the atrium, and anyone could kind of be inspired by them. Here's the other one. I called the first one the, li the, the reading chair, and I called this one the listening chair. And when you sit inside of it, you kind of have this... It's a zone. You can hear yourself think. So these things are side by side, and, and the scientists, I don't actually know what they do with these now, but it's, it's... But that was a drawing that became a chair. Well, here's a chair that became a drawing. And I think these categories are interesting when they start to get all messed up. <clears throat> here's a still life in motion. <laughs> this is a telephone. Um... This is, a, this is a table. I built this table in the Philippines. I was doing a lot of one-of-a-kind furniture building in the Philippines. But I just got like, getting all excited because a, a colorful table that looks like a bunch of, looks like a fruit bowl. I mean, but the fruit bowl is built in to the leg, so you don't have to actually put it in the middle of the table where it's in the way. Very practical. <laughs> and this is a cabinet, which is like a watermelon, I guess. And you can hang your hats on it. Everyone needs one. This is... <laughs> But actually, seriously, what I was very, very interested in these projects was they're funny and they've got cartoons and they sort of enable a sort of unexpected way of bringing humor or whimsy into your lifestyle. But for me, they were an exploration of, of, of painting and... Oh, I have zero seconds left. Is that true? Oh, dear. I think that's true. I'm taking way too much time. But I'm having fun. LAUGHTER